And should we admit uh, everyone on uh, on the Zoom link? Yeah, please go ahead and tell me when to go. Just give me a thumbs up. So welcome everyone, greetings to colleagues and to students and to everyone who's uh, watching us through Zoom and on our uh, Facebook um, a page. This is the second installment of the Athens PIL discussion group series. And this afternoon, we're very happy to have um, a very distinguished speaker, uh, two actually distinguished colleagues who, who will be, who join us for this uh, discussion group. Uh, today, uh, Professor Filippo Webb will be speaking on the right to fair trial, the most litigated yet elusive human right. Um, I'm sure we'll have to see what she means about elusive uh, since it's such a, uh, a right which we see everywhere. I mean, in uh, jurisprudence of international tribunals uh, and of course, it is uh, based on a book which was co-authored by Filippo Webb, which you might have all seen and was published in its first edition in 2020, uh, The Right to a Fair Trial in International Law. I have to congratulate at the outset uh, Filippo Webb and of course, Amal Clooney, who co-authored this book, we just um, we were just informed by Professor Webb uh, that this book has been awarded the American Society of International Law Certificate of Merit for 2022. So well done. And this edition is being complete, completed, I should say, by another one on the travel preparatoire of uh, Article 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which was is out. It's been out for, I think, a few weeks now. Uh, again, from Oxford University Press. So, Filippo Webb, let me introduce my speakers. She, Filippa is a professor of public international law at King's College London. She's a barrister at 20 Essex Chambers. Previously, she served as a special assistant and legal officer to Judge Ross Higgins during um, her presidency of the International Court of Justice and has held positions in the International Criminal Court and the UN headquarters. Her publications, of course, except for, for today's The Right to Fair Trial, um, uh, also include um, uh, Oppenheim's International Law, the new edition, the 2021 edition, uh, the Law of State Immunity, of course, her, her classical work with Lady uh, Hazel Fox, and International Judicial Integration and Fragmentation in 2015. Her work has been extensively cited. And then to discuss, and uh, I, I, I hope he will not create a panic to our colleague, Filippo Webb, is my distinguished uh, colleague and friend, Professor Yuval Shani. Professor Yuval Shani is the Hirsch Lauterpacht Chair uh, Holder in International Law at the Hebrew University. And of course, he was former Chair of the United Nations Human Rights Committee. His latest publication is The Extraterritorial Application of International Human Rights Law. It just appeared in the Hague Academy uh, courses of 2020. And of course, we know him from his first excellent book on competing jurisdictions of international courts and tribunals, which we teach, I have to say, at my faculty, you all. So Professor Shani, you, you owe me one for that. I will turn the floor immediately uh, to uh, Filippa, um, you have the floor. Let me say what a pleasure it is. All our people here at Athens PIL who are following both in Athens and all over Europe, as you know, are very happy and honored to have you. So over to you, Philippa. Thank you so much, Faye. So first of all, I send greetings from Amal, who sends her best wishes to Faye, Yuval, Nick, Demetrius, Martina, and all the members of the Athens PIL group. 
Uh, she said to, that she recalled her excitement at visiting Greece and fighting for the return of the Parthenon sculptures, which is a fight that continues to go on. And I'm very honoured to have Faye as moderator and Yuval as the discussant today. Um, as we've heard, they have both served on the UN Human Rights Committee, Faye as the current chair, and the Human Rights Committee in its general comment number 32 was a touchstone for Amal and me during the drafting of the book, given its preeminent role in interpreting Article 14. And we also noticed the careful attention that was given to fair trial rights in general comment number 36 on the right to life in which Yuval played such a major role. And it's still on the Human Rights Committee. It's wonderful to see that the committee has introduced oral comments in appropriate cases that raise complex issues of fact or domestic law or important questions of interpretation. This will surely enhance the committee's effectiveness and certainly uh, represents best practice in fair hearings. So this evening, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to firstly briefly explain why Amal and I chose to write this book. I'm then going to outline why the right to a fair trial is the most litigated human right, and yet the most elusive one. Elusive, uh, coming back to Faye's introduction, in terms of being actually realized in practice. And I'm going to look at the big picture as well as some specific cases to help bring this to life. And then I'm going to return to the importance of the right to a fair trial and how that is represented by its status in customary international law. So first turning to why we chose to write this book and spend four years doing it. And I have to say, it isn't Yuval who's given me panic. It was Faye who kept mentioning edition, implying that there's gonna be a second edition, which we can't countenance at the moment. But we spent four years writing this book because we realized that despite the importance of the right to a fair trial, most leading human rights textbooks don't even have a chapter on it or don't engage in detailed analysis. And there are, of course, great academic studies on uh, fair trial rights, but until now they've been focused on just the European Convention or just the International Covenant or a specific regional treaty, rather than a holistic understanding of the right. So we thought if this right is to be brought to life, we have to know what it means on the international plane. We noticed that lawyers in domestic courts have tended to shy away from citing an international standard for a fair trial. They tend to revert to domestic law or to their relevant regional treaty. But if there was a very clear international standard defined in granular detail and lawyers start to invoke it in court, then judges will have to grapple with it. And it has the potential to protect an innocent suspect or to expose a corrupt prosecutor or judge. So our aim in this book was to codify the due process guarantees required in any criminal trial around the world. And as you'll see, even from the table of contents, and as you'll see why it took a thousand pages to do this, we look at this in, in great detail. Does the right to counsel mean the right to choose a counsel, even if you're not paying for them? Can you choose not to have a counsel and represent yourself? If you speak an indigenous language as well as another language, do you have a right to testify in your indigenous language? Does the right to silence protect you from having to give DNA? These are the kinds of questions that we look at and we chart the international law response to them and also the remedies that have been made available under international law. So, Turning to the second point, the most litigated human right and yet the most elusive. More than half the cases before the Human Rights Committee concern Article 14 of the ICCPR. And at the European Court of Human Rights, 49%, so almost half of the cases involve fair trial violations. Now they often involve other human rights violations as well, but fair trial is represented in 49% of cases. That is more than double the number of cases that invoke any other human right. And in the last six months alone, there have been more than 100 Article 6 cases at the European Court. 
fair trials in a just legal system are a precondition for, and we believe a symptom of a well-functioning democracy. Whereas an undemocratic system will use the court system to shore up its power, to silence its critics and to intimidate its citizens. And this link between democracy and fair trials is ever more important. The University of Gothenburg's Democracy Institute reports that there are more autocracies than democracies in the world today. And Freedom House, which is monitoring a free expression, of course, but that is also related to fair trials, said that in uh, 2020, there's been a decline in democracy in 18 states. Only five states improved. I checked Greece. Greece has remained stable um, and, and very democratic. But for other states, that was not the case. And this has been the 17th year in decline uh, in terms of democracy around the world. So we have the most litigated right. It's certainly being brought before international human rights bodies. And there is this rich jurisprudence um, that has emerged from them but it's also elusive in practice and perhaps ever more elusive with uh, these undemocratic trends. So let's have a look at some of the big picture factors um, and symptoms of the elusiveness of a fair trial. The pandemic, along with its impacts on every other aspect of our lives, has worsened an already fragile situation for fair trials. In nearly, I think, all legal systems, there have been COVID-related delays. Just in the UK alone, uh, victims, including teenagers and witnesses, are having to wait up to four years uh, from the time of the alleged offence to their case reaching trial, this including in the youth courts. But there are more systemic issues emerging as well and not necessarily related to COVID. Uh, the NGO Fair Trials issued a report uh, last year on Europe's criminal justice system. And they concluded that cr Europe's criminal justice institutions and policies have a problem with systemic racism. They say that certain ethnic groups and minorities, people from African descent, Roma, Muslims, Jewish people, migrants, and asylum seekers are subject to unfair treatment and discrimination through the criminal justice system. And they point specifically to the right to counsel, the right to defense, the right to interpretation, uh, the right to be present and the presumption of innocence. And looking now on a country level, in Greece, um, the NGO Fair Trials examined pre-trial detention case files uh, just to get a sense of uh, some of these issues. And they found that um, none of the pre-trial detention case files that they analysed had been translated in cases where 43% of the individuals were non-nationals. And where there were uh, instances of uh, interpretation, um, even if not translation, it was considered to be of poor quality. In the UK, there's been funding cuts to legal aid for more than a decade. We have one of the highest popu prison populations in Europe. And as I've already mentioned, pre-trial detention is a huge issue uh, that's just been exacerbated by the pandemic. Another way of identifying systemic problems is through conviction rates. You would expect if you have a fair process um, with strong defense rights, that uh, there'll be a mixed picture in terms of whether there's convictions and acquittals. Yet the conviction rate in Japan is 99%. In Israel, it's 99%. In the United States, it is 90% with more than 97% of those convictions resulting from guilty pleas. So you're not even getting to the stage of a fair hearing. Now, of course, there are more extreme situations than that. We just have to look at the Taliban in Afghanistan, which has declared that it is uh, holding all its criminal trials in private and that they will be weighed in favour of Islamic clerics. And of course, there's extensive extrajudicial executions. So of course, the systemic problems uh, vary in their gravity, but they are systemic. And the elusive nature of the right to a fair trial can also be seen in individual cases. 
So in Russia, opposition leader Alexei Navalny is currently in prison for parole violations. In 2017, the European Court of Human Rights found that his trial, uh, which was on financial crimes, was arbitrary and manifestly unfair and demanded his release. But we know that hasn't happened. Um, when he failed to report to the probation service last year, including a period where he couldn't report because he was recovering uh, from a coma uh, after a poisoning, he was jailed as soon as he landed in Moscow. And now his brother is facing charges. Uh, his foundation has been labeled extremist and banned in Russia. And uh, Amnesty um, last month, uh, marking the one year uh, after his rejailing in Moscow, says that he is in a living hell in prison and faces up to 15 additional years for charges like contempt of court, fraud, and money laundering. In Iran, the human rights activist Najis Mohammadi was sentenced to eight additional years in prison plus 70 lashes after a five minute trial. And in Belarus, Ms. Ekaterina Bava Klova, a journalist, has been charged with public order offenses when she reported on protests in Minsk, as you'll remember, that were being held in late 2020. She was arrested by security forces in Balaclavas, detained and then sentenced to two years in prison. Uh, the American Bar Association, working with the Clooney Foundation for Justice, monitored her trial and found uh, numerous violations, including the fact that she was kept in a cage during the proceedings, which uh, undermined the presumption of innocence somewhat, and that her key witnesses, both um, eyewitness evidence and expert uh, evidence witnesses were denied. So obviously affecting her right to mount her defense. And in the Maldives, uh, former president Nasheed was subject to a politicized prosecution. And just to give you a flavor of some of the violations and the creativity in, in these violations, uh, he had a trial before three judges. This was on his appeal. Two of those three judges had been witnesses for the prosecution in the prior proceeding. And suddenly they're appearing on the bench. The trial started the day after his arrest. Uh, he was therefore not allowed to be represented by a counsel of his choice because in the Maldives, it takes two days to register um, for counsel to register for a case. And uh, he was obviously tried within one day. His trial came before the Human Rights Committee, and the committee found that the Maldives was obliged to quash his conviction, to review the charges, and if appropriate, to conduct a new trial and restore his right to stand for office and take steps to avoid similar violations in the future. Since then, President Nasheed uh, returned to the Maldives. He was severely wounded in an explosion, um, shrapnel from the bomb missed his heart by less than one centimeter. He recovered and then returned to the Maldives where he is now the Speaker of Parliament and a leading voice for action on climate change. Definitely an inspirational story against the odds. So now I come to the importance of a fair trial uh, given its elusive nature and given both its systemic um, non-compliance and its abuse in individual cases. So what we do in the book is we disaggregate the components of a fair trial and we also try to establish each component as a customary right uh, as well as the overall right. And when we disaggregated the right we found uh, it fell into naturally into 13 component rights. Um, some of these I've already mentioned, but I'll just uh, list them now. So first, the right to a competent, independent and impartial tribunal established by law. And that is chapter one of the book, uh, because we believe that's the most important component, right? If you don't have a competent, independent and impartial tribunal established by law, then even if every other component right is beautifully complied with, you can never have a fair trial. Um, other component rights include the right to a public trial, the presumption of innocence, the right to prepare a defense, the right to counsel, 
the right to be tried without undue delay, the right to be present, which has been uh, an interesting one in, in the age of Zoom. Uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A if you like. Uh, the right to examine witnesses, the right to an interpreter, the right to silence, um, or sometimes called the privilege against self-incrimination, the right to appeal, the right to equality before the courts, and finally, the right not to be subject to double jeopardy. And for each of these component rights, we've examined sources, including um, the international human rights bodies in the UN system, the UN special procedures, uh, courts and tribunals of general jurisdiction, uh, international criminal courts and tribunals, regional courts and commissions, soft law developed by the UN, regional bodies, NGOs, and expert groups, such as the Syracuse principles. Um, and we've also occasionally referred to the case law of national jurisdictions, where there are leading cases that are cited by international courts or innovative decisions that may represent best practice. And going through all of these sources, um, we came to the conclusion that the right as a whole um, and most of the 13 component rights have achieved customary status. And just some of the evidence going towards that is that the right to a fair trial appears in all the major human rights instruments. It appears in numerous military manuals, in the statutes of all the international criminal courts. And strikingly, even those few states that are not party to the ICCPR have codified fair trial rights in their domestic legislation. So China in its constitution gives a right to a public hearing, a right to a defense and a guarantee of judicial independence. Whether these are realized in practice is obviously a different question. Saudi Arabia in its basic law and its criminal procedure also provides for fair trial rights. And the UAE's constitution speaks of equality before the law, the right to counsel and the presumption of innocence. The ICTY appeals chamber affirmed the right to a fair trial is of course a requirement of customary international law. The Inter-American Commission has said the same and the International Committee of the Red Cross has said it is a norm of customary international law. In the book, we also look at the confirmation that the overall right and most of its component rights are non-derogable, even in states of emergency. And here the Human Rights Committee uh, comes into play again, because even though the right to a fair trial is not included in the list of non-derogable rights in the ICCPR, the committee has said that states parties may in no circumstances invoke Article 4 on derogations as a justification for acting in violation of humanitarian law or peremptory norms of international law, for instance, by deviating from the fundamental principles of a fair trial. And the Inter-American Commission has explained that even in an emergency situation, right to due process and fair trial must be respected because they play such an essential role in the protection of non-derogable rights. The African Commission doesn't actually allow derogation from any right in the African Charter. And in the Arab Charter, the right to a fair trial is expressly non-derogable. And as we went through all of the material, looking also at the commentaries uh, in IHL, we found that all of all the 13 component rights, only two of them could be said to be derogable in situations of uh, national emergency. And those are the right to a public trial, which already has um, exceptions built into it, and the right to translation of documents, which is an aspect of the right to an interpreter. So that we would argue the right to an interpreter is non-derogable, but the corollary right of having core documents translated in a case may be derogable in an emergency. And some people, we didn't take a position on this, but some uh, distinguished people have even said that the overall right to a fair trial is a use Kogan's norm. That's uh, Judge Robinson of the ICJ and formerly of the Inter-American Commission and the ICTY and Judge Consado Trindade, uh, also of the ICJ and formerly of the Inter-American Court uh, on Human Rights. And this has also been suggested by the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. 
So the great uh, Australian judge, who I'm sure you know, Justice Michael Kirby, who's also served in various UN roles, has argued in favour of the powerful influence of international standards on human rights in domestic systems. He said it is a powerful idea and it is the privilege of lawyers to contribute to this inevitable and natural historical development. So despite the elusive nature of the right to a fair trial in numerous places around the world, it's our privilege to contribute to the clarity of international standards and we hope to positive developments in fulfilling those standards and holding states accountable when they are not met. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippa. This was very illuminating. And I think um, um, this Article 14 is really the nucleus of the international protection um, of uh, the right to fair trial. Of course, it has many components, which we could discuss whether all of these are equally um, customary. And then uh, another question is about use Kogans, which you, you referred to, and which has all, also been discussed in reaction to your, uh, to your book. So I will just give the floor immediately to Yuval for his thoughts, and then we can open the discussion. I think there's many threads here that we can pull and see how to go ahead. Go ahead, Yuval, over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Faye. And uh, congratulations again, Philippa, to you and to Amal for, um, well, first for an excellent and extremely important uh, contribution. And I think it is well deserved of an American Society Certificate of Merits. So uh, well done. Um, and it is really a valuable resource uh, because, you know, it, it has everything you, you, well, almost everything you want to know about Article 14. I'm, I'm saying almost because, I mean, even the thousand odd pages, I mean, they, they, they do not cover everything. The book does, does indicate that, for instance, detention, pretrial detention, this is not really, I mean, it is addressed, but somewhat um, uh, sporadically. Uh, but the core of the Article 14 trial protections are really covered in, a, in an extremely uh, comprehensive, uh, detailed, and very accessible form. So uh, if you want to know about the practice surrounding Article 14, the interpretative issues relating to Article 14, and the legal status of the different the 13 components, I mean, this is, this is going to be the, the one-stop shop for, for dealing with Article 14 at least un, 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 until the second edition comes along. And then, and then of course, uh, uh, but that will take Philippa and Amal probably uh, one more or two, one, two more years, right? Now, I, I fully subscribe to, 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 the, to, to how Faye and Philippa um, categorize Article 14 really as a, as a gateway to human rights protection. I mean, it, it is an extremely important Right, because domestic courts are, are an extremely important venue uh, for upholding human rights. So in a way, uh, trials are not only about guilt and innocence, they're also about upholding rights of, of individuals. So if an individual is being uh, wrongfully convicted, uh, that it, it's not only a question, of course, of, of, uh, of, of, um, of, of due process of fair trial. This is also a question about liberty. It's also a question about uh, life, the right to life. It's also a question about discrimination. So in a way, Article 14 is, is, is extremely valuable uh, for its own sake, but it is also extremely, extremely valuable in the sense that it does protect uh, very important uh, other substantive rights uh, of human rights law uh, and of course also domestic uh, constitutional law. I, I remember, uh, being shocked uh, when hearing Justice Scalia at the time uh, expressing the position that the U.S. Constitution does not prohibit executing the innocent. It is, on, it is only requiring providing every defendant with fair trial guarantees. But, but I always thought that this is really not the way you should understand a constitutional law or human rights law. It's not about protecting the uh, just rules of a game. This is about protecting substantive values. And I think the international, international human rights law by and large does not subscribe to the Scalian understanding 
of uh, what the, is, the, is the social role of, uh, of due process guarantees. A and I think uh, in itself, I mean, uh, the trial does constitute a venue of potential state oppression. So, so when, we, when we are thinking about human rights, we are thinking of substantive rights, uh, which, uh, which um, have to do with abuse of power, uh, which have to, to do with denial of justice, but the trial itself could be uh, a venue of, of such um, pathologies. And I think we have seen in recent years when we are looking at the process of democratic backsliding, we have seen in, in a number of uh, areas around the world including in Europe, uh, we have seen actually the courts being um, the venue of attempts to really scale down democratic guarantees. It's not accidental that courts have been really the focus of certain uh, uh, illiberal, refor illiberal uh, reforms in, in backsliding democracies. So, so I really cannot uh, underscore enough how much Article 14 is critical to the world of human rights law. And, and Philippa is right that we do have this uh, um, mismatch between the importance of the right and the limited treatment of that right in the literature. And, and therefore, I'm extremely happy to see this uh, book fill this gap. Now, now, I would say, I thought maybe I would say a few words about um, some of the great difficulties that have to do with Article 14 and the application of Article 14, both in terms of theory, but also uh, okay. in terms of practice, and, and maybe uh, uh, rely a little bit on my uh, recollections from my experience at the committee uh, with okay. Faye and, and the other members of the committee. So, so I think w one challenge for the article, for upholding Article 14, is, is diversity and, and diversity across legal cultures. Uh, I think this is one of the, I mean, some rights, I mean, are, are not so much context dependent. I mean, wh when one goes to define what constitutes torture, okay, I, I, think, I think it's relatively straightforward. I mean, th there would be some variations, but, but they would be rather minor. I mean, uh, I mean, pain is a universal, right? Pain, suffering are universal attributes. When one is talking about what is due process, I think it, it is a bit more difficult because the trial, the, the, the social process that we call the, the legal proceedings are, are very much embedded in, in very different legal cultures. Uh, so applying a one size fits all uh, framework of analysis is going to be uh, quite challenging. I I'll give you one example, Philippa alluded and it's also mentioned in the book, the number, uh, the issue of conviction rates. Uh, so there are very high conviction rates in some countries and not so high conviction rates in other countries. But, but that in itself, uh, I mean, it means something, but it doesn't mean everything. I mean, there is, for instance, a very large difference between countries where the prosecution has no choice but to bring uh, charges upon uh, the fulfillment of certain criteria and countries where the prosecution exercises discretion on whether or not to bring a case forward. So, so you would have expect countries with prosecutorial discretion to have higher conviction rates than countries without prosecutorial discretion because the, 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 they, they cannot just select the, the good cases. They have to bring in forward all the cases. So this is just one uh, small uh, example. Uh, when one is talking from a practical point of view, um, and from the uh, uh, vantage point of an international body that is expected to uh, monitor uh, how national courts are applying due process guarantees, one has to add um, not only the problem of diversity uh, and the limited uh, understanding sometimes of the inner workings of different uh, legal systems, but also uh, epistemic limits of uh, international adjudication in the sense that it is very hard for people who are sitting in Strasbourg or in San Jose or in uh, Arusha or in Geneva to actually uh, second guess decisions of local courts on matters of credibility of witnesses, on sufficiency of evidence, and even on reasonableness of, of penalties. So the combination of great diversity and the epistemic limits in exercising international supervision does result in what the book actually describes as deferential standards 
of review. Either you call it the margin of appreciation or you call it like we call it the Human Rights Committee. Is there a manifest error? Is it clearly arbitrary? Was there a denial of justice? Which means that the right to some extent, it enjoys international protection, but that international protection protection has its limit. And I think that's an important we lost point. The book does a very good job in uh, clarity. I, I was going to say something about lack of clarity. So I guess the, the, the reception has adjusted itself to, uh, to the lack of clarity. Do you hear me well now? Yeah, OK. So uh, yes, yes. <laughs> maybe I've upset the internet gods a little bit. Uh, so, 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 so the lack of clarity, I think, is really uh, a chronic issue. I mean, General Comment 32 does, from the Human Rights Committee's point of view, does assist to some extent. But there are still many issues on which I felt throughout my service in the committee, and even now after my service in the committee, that there are some conceptual and practical issues that are still uh, unclear. I'll give you, in the interest of time, just a couple uh, of examples. Uh, first, um, are we talking about absolute or relative rights, rights components? I mean, this is, uh, I mean, some of the uh, paragraphs are formulated, some of the rights are formulated as relative rights. So for instance, uh, the, the, public net, the, the public nature of the proceedings, I mean, this is something that states have some discretion. This is clear from the language of Article 14. But then some uh, provisions are drafted as absolute standards. For instance, the right to be uh, tried in one's presence or the, uh, or the um, uh, prohibition against, I mean, the, the protection of the right to silence. I mean, the right of the accused to, but in practice, I think many international courts and many domestic courts treat these rights in a somewhat flexible manner and do, uh, for instance, accept circumstances when uh, an unruly defendant would be, uh, would be uh, um, removed from the court or with regard to, uh, for instance, confronting the witnesses. I mean, we had a human rights committee case uh, a, a Russian case about um, a sexual offense and uh, and whether um, th there would be circumstances in which cross examination would be uh, uh, would be waived by the court under certain uh, circumstances or uh, whether uh, something can be the, what 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 could be inferred from the silence of the accused. The European Court has taken a somewhat different view, and many states are taking different view. So I think this is a fundamental issue for which I'm not sure that we have a very coherent approach on whether the rights are relative or absolute. And I would be interested to hear Philippa's thoughts on that if we have time uh, as well. Uh, a second issue is uh, what is the scope of, pro of proceedings that are covered by Article 14? Uh, for instance, I had, a, I had a great difficulties during my time on the, com uh, on the committee with the proposition that extradition or deportation proceedings are not covered by Article 14. Now, for the Human Rights Committee, that's not a big issue uh, when one is talking about the rights of aliens, paradoxically, because the rights of aliens are protected by another article, Article 13 of the Covenant. And, and the committee has said, well, Article 13 applies in deportation cases. But, um, but we read in the, the standards of protection of Article 14. But when one is dealing with deportation of one's own citizen, and we had a case like that, uh, when the issue was raised, um, we, we found ourselves in somewhat of a, of, a, of, a, of, of, of a bind because the doctrine was that extradition proceedings are not covered by Article 14. And this is, of course, uh, when th thinking about basic rights, I mean, this is as, as, as a basic right as, as, as one gets. So, so I think this is another area where we do have uh, a, a lot of uh, unclarity. I'm sensing that my time is running short and I don't, uh, I don't want to speak too much. Maybe I will just say uh, one word about remedies, which the book uh, deals with. And I think this is a, a, very, important, uh, a very important issue. And then I will, uh, I will say something on non-derogability and then I will conclude. So I think on remedies, uh, 
Here, uh, the book does mention that there is a, a difference in approach between uh, the Inter-American and the European court that uh, are quite slow to order release in cases involving due process uh, violations, whereas for the Human Rights uh, Committee, this is a much uh, more frequent, um, relatively speaking, a much more frequent remedy that is being uh, offered. I, I actually was surprised uh, reading this. I mean, I haven't done, of course, this, the same kind of investigation. And I think it may be telling. Uh, and it may be telling because we know that in terms of remedy, the remedy of reopening existing proceedings is amongst the most difficult remedies that could be ordered by an international court because it really goes directly against the notion of finality of legal proceedings, which is a core uh, idea about criminal justice systems. And it is probably as an intrusive remedy as an international court or, or body can, issue, can, can decree. And it is quite interesting to see that the courts that are uh, have less power and authority in terms of formal legal authority, are uh, more um, flexible or are more uh, ready to uh, walk down that path. So that maybe gives you uh, some insight about the interplay between power, responsibility, uh, <laughs> compliance, and, and maybe what we call chutzpah in international, uh, in international uh, law. And, and finally, I wanted to say, well, well, um, well, I have two, well, two things actually on the, uh, on the issue of non-derogability, I find the analysis extremely interesting uh, that certain components of uh, the right to due pro to fair trial are, are non-derogable. I, I did want, however, to express uh, one express some doubt as to whether state practice actually uh, is compatible with this proposition. I mean, uh, human rights treaty uh, treaty bodies and human rights courts. Um, often have a tendency to identify more and more components as uh, core rights or non-derogable features. Uh, but um, I have doubts as to, to what extent would the member states of the different treaties and the different uh, treaty regimes uh, actually adhere to these standards, whether we actually have practice which is in domestic law, which is compatible with these assertions. And I also have some doubts about the value of these assertions, since if we accept that almost all of these rights components are the euro or de facto relative in nature, the gap between a, a, a non-derogable right, which is relative, and a derogable right, which is also relative, is actually quite uh, symbolic. So if we take the view that the length of trial is non-derogable, but in actuality, we do accept that mega trials, including international criminal law trials, can take years and years and years. Then the Especially, fact that they are yeah. non really means very little in the real world. Where I think the, uh, the book makes, and with this I wanted to conclude, a very important contribution is with identifying the, the category of flagrant denial of justice as a category that enjoys heightened protection in deportation cases. But I think that this actually is more important than in deportation cases. I think this is really becoming the core aspect of the right for which you could actually make a strong case about non-derogability and also maybe about the uh, peremptory status. So I think this is uh, in terms of identifying a, a subcategory which actually makes a difference. I think this is what the human rights, the European court as I, as, has referred to as a flagrant denial. The human rights committee has not gone so far uh, in, this, in this direction. And I think, Faye, I think maybe it should go in that direction. Thank you very much, Philippa, for a really, really a wonderful book. Thank you, Yuval. We'll see about where um, the human rights committee will go. Before I hand over the floor to my, to our, uh, to my team to see for questions and answers. Um, the issue of the remedies and reopening proceedings, um, as you've all mentioned, has been very important uh, in our uh, in the Human Rights Committee. It's uh, given rise to quite uh, a number of discussions among members. 
whether and with you've all rightly said that you know mostly uh, an opinion that uh, we sh the committee should uh, uh, propose this or recommend this um, has been the object of discussion and often it has much of the regret maybe of some of us who think uh, you know the difficulty of really going back into the domestic proce proceeding and requesting a court to open uh, reopen a proceeding and that is very hard one more issue I'd like to add to this discussion, which I think is starting to open, open now in, the, in recent years, is this idea of, of course, Article 14 is, is concentrating on criminal law, but the, the first article, the overhead, the, you know, 14.1, in talking about suit of law, has also given, is given now an opening, and there is discussion on what what, which of the guarantees of the sub are, uh, of the subparagraphs uh, of the components, as you say, Philippa, uh, could possibly be applicable uh, in a non-criminal proceeding context. And um, so that is something that is, you know, coming up into discussions in, in recent cases before the committee. And a third thing is also the right of the judiciary to a fair trial. Uh, you were talking before about, uh, you know, countries where, uh, you know, there's an oppression and, and, and non, not very democratic countries. And the issue also of how um, um, independent judiciary might be punished in a way, uh, in various ways, uh, is also an issue that is, is at some point comes also in um, high profile cases before uh, the Human Rights Committee, perhaps more than before the European Court of Human Rights, but there, I'm not sure whether uh, there could be an explanation. But these are my comments to add to Filippa. I don't know whether Filippa wants to um, go ahead with this, with the first round and then Nicola, if we have people, if we have questions, can you sort of gather them then for a second round? Okay, so over to you, Filippa. For the youth Kogans, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, we, we, we didn't take a position on youth Kogans, but we flagged those who, who had. And, um, and Amal had previously worked for, for Judge Robinson, um, not, not when he uh, wrote about fair trial in youth Kogans. Um, <laughs> but there's a background there. Um, so thank you so much for these comments um, and, you know, so much to think about and mull over. Um, just a few reactions and then I'm very happy to, to move to the questions from the audience or any follow-up questions. Um, so, yes, it's not one, but to some of um, Yuval's points, it's not one size fits all, um, Article 14. Uh, and but what we say is that it is a flaw, so it is the minimum standard. And then we do see the variation, we see the adaptation, we see the relativity that you talk about. But the position we take is that that is a flaw um, that uh, applies to all states. Uh, on conviction rates, um, just to agree with you that this is just a very rough measure um, and they can be interpreted in different ways. and. A low conviction rate is also uh, not promising. In India, there's an overall conviction rate of around 50% in criminal cases. That drops to a 6% conviction rate if the defendant is a politician, which implies something is going on there. Um, on the, the relativity point, which is very interesting, absolute or relative rights and um, I, I don't have a component by component answer on that, but I think two, two reflections on that. First, it links with one of the points that Faye has made, that uh, these rights are not just necessarily um, enjoyed by the defendant. They are rights that the judiciary, the prosecution, uh, victims and witnesses also have um, some entitlement to, and then you get into a balancing test. Uh, even the general public, one would say, has an interest in the right to be tried without undue delay, because that's a right. And I have to say, 
within fair trial. That is the most litigated right within fair trial um, because that is a symptom of a legal system that's just not working and not uh, delivering justice. Um, and the second point is, uh, I, I think the way that these rights, some of them have been phrased, but also how they've been interpreted and how there's the discretion um, among states has really come to the fore during the pandemic uh, and the adjustments that uh, various domestic jurisdictions have made. And I think it's striking that only two states have, have expressly derogated from the right to a fair trial under Article 14 during the pandemic. They are Estonia and Georgia. Um, so they uh, said that they would be derogating from Article 14. No other state felt the need to make that express derogation. Now, once again, lots of room for interpretation here. It may be because those states were interpreting, for instance, the right to be present as including virtual presence and believing that they could continue um, with criminal proceedings in that way. It may also mean that some states were just not respecting fair trial and not formally derogating from it. Um, but it is striking that, you know, in, a, in conditions in which it was completely overturned um, so many uh, ways we interact, but including the way we deliver criminal justice, only two states um, felt the need to make that derogation. Um, and then just uh, my last point on um, uh, remedies and the, you know, I think there's definitely sociological, anthropological research that would enrich um, the different, the quite different behaviours of the courts. Um, the Inter-American Court, for example, gives incredibly creative and detailed remedies. Um, so in one case where the right to interpreter had not been respected, actually, and they said that right belonged to a victim, um, among the various uh, require, uh, orders that they made, they gave a scholarship to her and her daughter to study at university, and they ordered um, specific training for uh, the police force. I mean, that you don't get that kind of specificity um, in other jurisdictions. Now, whether that's implemented or not, I don't know. So is it just aspirational? But it, it's quite striking to see that in the Inter-American Court. And just on the issue of release, I go back to the President Nasheed case, which is one of the rare cases which was heard in two bodies. It was heard in um, the working group on arbitrary detention and then in the Human Rights Committee. And the working group ordered his immediate release and the Human Rights Committee did not, uh, but they ordered the quashing of his conviction, which I think would then lead the domestic jurisdiction to his release. But it was interesting how um, the Human Rights Committee stepped back from actually putting release uh, into its order. And I think that reflects some of the points that Faye and Yuval have been making. Thank you. Thanks, Philippa. Um, I think I had a message that our my colleague Maria Gavonelli, ah, there she is, wanted to take the floor perhaps and give us her um, thoughts. Maria. Thank Maria you, is also the president of the Human Rights, uh, the Hellenic Commission. Human Rights Commission. So um, maybe uh, she so, wants to go on the problem uh, of her trial in Greece. Go on, Maria. Uh, thank you so much, Ray. Um, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Philippa, for this. And uh, congratulations for an excellent uh, uh, bit of work. A bit, <laughs> slightly. Um, Yuval, thank you for being among us. It's always a pleasure to, to have you around. Um, I was... Um, thinking about your con 13 constitutive rights. Uh, and I was actually nodding very wisely while you have mentioned uh, Greece and um, that particular case yet that you have indicated. I don't know anything about that. The, 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 the idea, however, brought to mind the fact that um, in this country, we end up with a perfect ensemble of all our rights, all the constitutive principles of uh, the right, all the, the bits and pieces in place. And yet at the end of the day, we end up with a system that produces incredible delays 
delays that move all the way up to denial of justice, perhaps not the flagrant cases that uh, you have encountered, but certainly denial of justice, and I have no qualms about that. My point is really that here we do not have necessarily a delay that is expressed in as a time management issue, sort of move along, you know, consult your, your uh, calendar and move on. But I uh, tend to conclude that it is more of a uh, structural problem. And I explain. What we have right now is a system, especially in criminal justice, where uh, you go, uh, you end up before the criminal courts, but before you go to trial, you have to go through a, a mini trial in the judicial council, where you employ the full toolbox of uh, criminal defense, including appeals on appeals on appeals. When your, that criminal trial is concluded, which might be two or three years later, it is then and only then that you would actually face a proper trial in an open court. And there you go again. And assuming that that is concluded within a fairly reasonable period of time, that means two or three years, then the case would reopen and be retried ex novo at the uh, Court of Appeal where again, you go through the process of judicial counsel plus trial. All the guarantees are in place. Everything is going by the book. But by the time you end up before Arios Pagos, our Supreme Court, that's probably 10 years down the line. Okay. Whether you're actually exonerated or not, convicted or not, becomes irrelevant, isn't it? Because clearly uh, there's no societal impact. Who remembers what happened 10 years ago? Uh, there's no preventive element in place. Again, who cares? That is ancient history. So uh, this is something that we have uh, seen uh, more and more happening, and it can be also uh, seen in some of the recent evaluations of Greece, not on human rights, but actually on corruption and financial issues, because that is also crucial for investment and whatnot. And we at the Greek National Commission for Human Rights are actually contemplating a, a, a full report on that, hopefully by the end of, of this year, or perhaps a little bit more, um, because we, this is a massive undertaking, as you might well imagine. Uh, and I wonder whether perhaps we, we shouldn't take into consideration also these kind of systemic approaches, uh, because that goes to uh, the effectiveness of, of, uh, of a case, isn't it? That goes to the effectiveness of, of justice overall. Uh, and it has, it's more than a sum of bits and pieces. Uh, it's not a process, you value, are absolutely right. Criminal justice is not a process, it's actually also a result. Uh, so there you are. I wonder if you had any comments on that. Thank you, Marianne, it's good Thanks. to see you. <laughs> um, and to hear of your uh, very important uh, position uh, in this important body. Um, yes, so uh, it, it's very interesting to hear about this. And I have to say that there's a lot of cases that you read with sort of similar issues. Uh, Italy is another jurisdiction um, that has the most cases before the European court claiming undue delay. Um, what, what the international human rights bodies have said and what you can distill from their jurisprudence is that um, structural problems uh, are not an excuse. So that at least, and the structural problems vary. So for some uh, jurisdictions, it's going to be a lack of resources. So there was one case involving 
a Caribbean state that we said we only have a single court typist. So that's why all our cases take eight years. You're talking about a different kind of structural issue where there's all these stages and all these possibilities to reopen and to appeal and to convene a special court. Um, even after the final appeal, uh, that just draws out this process. But I think the same reasoning would apply, that this kind of dysfunctional system, either through lack of resources or through excessive um, levels of uh, review, is not an excuse for delay. And you can still apply the framework um, that all the human rights bodies apply for uh, assessing whether a delay is reasonable or unreasonable. And you would apply it to scenarios like you have described and find that it is unreasonable because the length of proceedings can be justified by the complexity of the facts, by the complexity of the charges. Um, but there's also a factor of prejudice to the defendant. And what you've described as prejudice to the defendant. So even in you know, the complexity of, of the facts in some of these cases or the complexity of the law that has to apl be applied. There's another factor, prejudice to the defendant. And international human rights bodies that have looked at that factor have said, this is the most important one to take into account. So I think there is jurisprudence um, that would support uh, the kind of uh, reforms that, that you're talking about, because this is not a, unfortunately not an isolated issue. And if I could just add one point to that about the really insightful point you made on systemic problems and how these are quite hard to capture. Um, that's something that we found in writing the book, and it's, it's certainly something I'm sure the Human Rights Committee has faced uh, again and again. You can have a, a trial that's perfect. Um, they have a, a wonderfully experienced counsel. They can call all the witnesses they want. An interpreter is provided. It may even be done within a reasonable time. The bench um, is well qualified and apparently impartial. Presumption of innocence is assumed. And yet the law that that person is charged under is, mm -hmm. um, for instance, you know, for being a homosexual, an unfair law and yet a perfectly fair trial. Mm -hmm. How does Article 14 deal with that? Um, what we try to argue in, in the book is that you have to bring it under the right to equality, which has perhaps been underutilized because there is discrimination in the sense of um, a discriminatory law being applied, but that's not a perfect slam dunk um, solution. So once again, that gap between um, process, outcome, procedure and substance is really important. Thanks. So I'm going to hand over to Nicolas Vulgaris um, to ask whether we have questions. I think you're collecting questions or you have questions of your own. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much, Professor. Go Francis. ahead. Um, first of all, allow me to thank Philippa for an excellent presentation. Um, yes, there is a question in the chat box from my colleague, Eleni Micha. Eleni, would you rather um, pose the question orally or do you want me to read it out? Whatever. Uh, it's convenient, Nicola. <laughs> I don't care. Was writing something, um, a further information, if you want to, to share. Please. Uh, so, uh, regarding the Greek cases before the CHR, uh, as far as I know, uh, there has been closing of these cases, of the group of cases um, named by, from the first case of Modern John regarding uh, interpretation and translation rights, among others, for aliens. And uh, there has been uh, in 2012, uh, as far as I may remember, uh, with a resolution, there has been legislative um, modification and a series of uh, administrative measures uh, regarding uh, these cases. So I don't know, Professor Webb, if you are referring to this group of cases or to other ones, but uh, uh, that, that's my um, information on that. And regarding the question, um, I was wondering whether uh, you are aware or you, ha you have some further um, feedback on the component of the um, Bicinidum principle. That, that, that's my interest, uh, the double jeopardy prohibition. 
And um, there has been a critique among academics and in Europe mostly um, that there is distant opinions or not clear as Professor Shani said, um, the judgments on between the CJHR, the CCPR and the CJ, but what we stand for when we uh, discuss uh, about prohibition of job, double jeopardy. We mean prohibition in, uh, in the borders of one state or between the different states. Uh, okay, uh, what's happening? And I was wondering, uh, what is your feedback on that? And if you think that uh, if we have divergent opinions or not clear ones, uh, perhaps there's a danger for the uniform application of fair trial rights? And what should we do? <laughs> that, 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 that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eleni. Um, so on the cases, when I was talking about the Greece information, that was from a January 2021 report by the NGO Fair Trials on the European mm -hmm. criminal justice system. So it may be that those were the underlying cases they were referring to, but I was relying on um, what they said uh, in those uh, in that report. Um, on double jeopardy, you are absolutely right that there's some divergence. Um, and uh, there's divergence in terms of um, whether it, it has to be in the same state or whether it can be um, transnational. Um, the uh, the there's treaties that the CJEU applies that allows a transnational um, perspective to be taken, whereas um, other courts take a, a a view just within the the state itself. And I mean, what can we do about it? I <laughs> I don't know. But what we've done about it <laughs> is, um, which is not <laughs> necessarily impactful yet, is that. Um, we try to report neutrally in the body of each chapter. We say this court does this, this court does this, here's you know, the, the standard we distill from that. But sometimes they're so divergent that you can't distill a standard. So what we do is you'll see in the conclusion to each chapter, we point out the different approaches and that's where we put um, our opinions out there and we um, make a recommendation. And um, I'm just finding what we said on double jeopardy. We say um, that from a humanitarian point of view, and we're quoting a, a commentator, I think it's uh, Manfred Novak, no less. Um, if a state has imposed an adequate penalty on a person for an offence, it should not be permissible for that person to be tried for the same offence in another jurisdiction. So we would not apply double jeopardy um, assuming that it has been adequately uh, applied, well, there's been an adequate penalty in for that person in the state, in another state. But, you know, there's a lot of variation, uh, Eleni, even beyond the geographic scope. Um, even the, there's an approach where what matters, is it the same offence that matters, a more narrow approach, or is it the same underlying conduct? And in one state, it might be, um, assault, and in another state, it might be grievous bodily harm. Um, is that, it, you know, it's not the same offence, but it might be the same conduct. So we um, also uh, point that out. The one shining light in this, to have a silver lining, is that the European Court jurisprudence on same offence and same conduct was very confused for many years with different chambers saying different things. And finally, in 2009, the Grand Chamber said, right, we're taking a position. Um, so at least within the European Court, that issue has been resolved. Hi, I, Nicola, I, over to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, uh, Philippa, there actually have been some comments, by, both by Yuval and Faye, on uh, the scope of application of, of the right. I mean, you've already referred to extradition cases. Uh, um, Professor Pazidis mentioned um, civil, uh, possibly, I mean, civil trials, which can be extended. Uh, so I would like your thoughts on that. And if I were to open up a bit the discussion from the, you know, uh, strictly uh, normative standpoint that we've been discussing so far, 
Um, you have painted at the beginning of your uh, presentation uh, a rather dim picture with those uh, systemic uh, non-compliance problems, and you link this to uh, a democracy problem over around the world. Um, so uh, my question would be, um, how forcefully do you make this claim in the book? I understand that it wasn't one of possibly one of the main uh, you know ideas behind the book, but it is present there clearly. And um, so, yeah, basically, uh, whether you are actually putting this forward and to what extent. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Nick. Um, so on scope of application, it's a really interesting uh, aspect of the right to a fair trial. And I, I just fully agree with everything Yuval said about extradition and the gap there when it's um, an own national. Um, uh, and I would just subscribe to what he said. Uh, we had challenges with defining the scope at two ends of the, of the process. Um, so, and Yuval mentioned this as well. Uh, there's a whole body of law, um, including Article 9 and of the ICCPR, dealing with what happens before trial, um, with charges, with pretrial detention, and so on. Now, that would have been, I don't know, another few hundred pages um, and another year and a half, I don't know. Um, so we don't really deal with that. The, the line we drew in the book, which is, you know, at least made sense to us, is that we will only deal with pretrial issues where this, they sort of continued into infecting the trial. Um, so undue delay is one example of that because pretrial detention definitely uh, affects your right to be tried without undue delay because it can often be the longest part um, of the time that you're in detention. And at if the I other may, sorry, yeah. if I may, Philippe, also, I mean, it could also be, you know, the, the right to have a lawyer. I mean, we, yeah. we've seen this and in an interpreter. Cases. I mean, and this pre-trial pre yeah. detention period is really a critical period where, you know, Article 9 doesn't really cover yeah. all the situations that one can encounter. Yeah. Sorry for butting in, but that no, no, it's a, a very good point. It's a very vulnerable period um, for a, a person who is a suspect. Um, and then the other end is sentencing. And so we, we do cover sentencing in the book and that has been interpreted in the jurisprudence of the tribunals as part of the trial. Um, but I mean, it obviously comes up in things like the right to appeal, but there's also all kinds of issues around, you know, inequality and sentencing and so on that, that we can't get into. Uh, and even the death penalty, obviously the ultimate type of sentence, um, we, uh, we just refer to that when there's heightened fair trial um, uh, aspects to it. So, the scope <laughs> um, can definitely be expanded. And it was a really interesting insight um, to hear from Faye on the civil and the criminal. This is something we lightly refer to in the introduction. Um, of course, in Article 14.1, it, it's expressly uh, saying fair and public hearing um, to with reference to both civil and criminal proceedings. But then the big question, um, Article 14.3 only talks about a person facing a criminal charge. So does that just not apply in civil proceedings? Um, and we see more and more um, that, of course, in a criminal proceeding, you face the loss of your liberty, possibly the loss of your life. But we see civil proceedings can be incredibly um, uh, draining financially, emotionally, stressful for people. Uh, we can see them lasting for years and ending up in fines that bankrupt them, that destroy their reputations. It's not that there's such a dramatic difference in outcome that suddenly these component rights uh, lose their meaning. Um, so I would argue that uh, the references to equality of arms and to adversarial proceedings, not in a common law sense, but in the sense of being able to put your case forward that have come out of the Article 14 one jurisprudence can start to bring in some of those Article 14 three rights as well. Maybe not as extensively uh, as for criminal proceedings, but it's not that they don't apply. Um, and then on democracy, uh, I think we mentioned this point in the introduction. It is not forcefully um, made in the book itself, but um, you know, beyond the book has a, a life 
and I hope an impact beyond um, being used as a doorstop, <laughs> um, which is that um, Amal has obviously uh, founded uh, the Clooney Foundation for Justice um, and I'm a member of the board. And you know, one of the most um, rewarding things about this book is that the research has led to and underpinned um, their trial watch program, which monitors trials around the world uh, and evaluates them against international standards. Uh, and will eventually, when they have enough data, lead to a global justice index. So we have the Freedom House Index on freedom of speech. This will hopefully be a global justice index on the fairness of trials around the world. And that's a few years off. Um, but hopefully that, that will be something that can um, draw that link, not just democracy and, and fair trials, but between you know, the the way human rights are realized in a society um, and the way their court system operates uh, to make that into a more transparent measure and one that can be used uh, for advocacy and change. Well, thank you. This has been a very stimulating discussion. Uh, Nicolas, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we have any more questions and as our time is really going, yes, okay. So um, I would like to thank both of you, Philippa, thank you very much. I, from your last remark, I understand you, you still have a lot of work to do. So uh, what you've always referring to before, I think some other volume should be coming out soon, uh, uh, well, along with the work you're doing with Amal. Yuval, it was very good to see you. Thank you for joining us and um, making the discussion even more interesting, colleagues. Um, from everywhere. It was great to see you again. It was great to be together again. Uh, and please join us for our next discussion group. That'll be coming up soon. I see Martin's here with Martin's Paparinskis. Philippa, thank you very much. Yuval, Shani, thank you, sir. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone much. for Thanks. being with us. Yeah. Thank you all.